is truly looking forward to the tools and tips that you are about to provide to caretakers and patients. But first, I'd love for you to introduce who you are and tell us about your work in healthcare. My name is uh, John Gear Sultan. I'm the founder of Patient Advocates of New York. Um, we basically help individuals and their loved ones to maneuver the healthcare system. Um, I have over 20 years of experience working in healthcare. My background includes uh, occupational therapy, athletic training, sports medicine, and um, healthcare administration and insurance. When we speak of patient voices and we speak of marginalized communities, can you talk about what marginalized patients look like? It's basically individuals that are afraid to speak up for themselves. They are in situations that they feel like they don't have any control and they're afraid of speaking up and the repercussions of speaking up and how that would impact them. And um, that's where uh, people like us come into play where we basically step in and say, hey, guess what? You have the power to speak up for yourself. And maybe at the time you might not have that power, um, but I'm gonna speak up for you or I'm gonna give you the tools to speak up for yourself. Let's dig a little deeper as to why people, why patients might be afraid to speak up when they're in clinical encounters or why they may feel that their voice have no power. And some of them are perceptions that they have that if they speak up somehow that they'll, you know, something might happen. Um, and some of them, it's actually true when you're in an institutional setting, let's say, and um, that's the only person that's there that's communicating with you, the healthcare worker or um, uh, the healthcare worker that's involved in your direct care. And you're afraid to, let's say, say something like, oh, I don't really like this soup that you keep bringing me um, because, you know, it doesn't taste that great. And you're afraid that next time that, that individual might not bring you a soup again, you know, or that uh, you're afraid uh, that you don't want to tell somebody that you don't want to go home. You want to go to another setting uh, instead of going home because you might have a situation where there's an abuser at home or, uh, you know, like somehow your quality of care is going to be impacted by just simply speaking up for yourself. And for people who have unstable home situations and they're in healthcare settings and they may be afraid to be discharged because they have these unstable home settings, what are some tools and tips you can provide to them so that they can advocate for themselves while they're in the healthcare setting? Basically encourage you to speak up, you know, talk to anybody in the facility um, that you feel comfortable with, that you feel comfortable sharing your story with and letting them know that you know, there's somebody at home that might be abusing me and I don't want to go home. It's that initial step that you have to take. And once you take that step, um, then everything comes into alignment. Let's say if you basically shared that story and nobody's doing anything. I mean, we're fortunate that we live in New York City. There's a lot of community resources. All you have to do is call 311 and let them know what's going on. And then from there, the... Uh, the representative there can guide you into resources that are available in the community. For patients who may have an issue while they're in the healthcare setting, what are some steps that they can take to be proactive in their care and make sure that they're being the best advocate that they can for themselves? Sometimes they have an issue that arises in a hospital or a nursing home or independent living or assisted living. Um, that once you speak up and you let somebody know um, and nothing's done, you know, you of course want to go through the hierarchy, but there are options for you outside of that institution. For example, in the um, nursing home, you have an ombudsman that's assigned to the nursing home. That if, you know, if it's escalated to the nursing home administrator that your needs are not being met, um, that you can reach out to the ombudsman and have them look into the case for you. And if nothing happens there, you have the Department of Health that you can call and have them advocate for you. Share your story, what, what's going on, and basically they can step in and advocate for you. And that goes same thing for the nursing home. You have the Department of Health, you have the Joint Commission. There are numerous organizations outside the facility that can come in and advocate for you. 
for people who may have family or friends in long-term care settings, what are some ways in which they can advocate for, for those patients, um, even from afar? Calling in. If you, if you could call in and just check on your loved one and see how they're doing, and then if they bring up a concern, that you bring it up, let's say if there's a nursing concern, that you call and ask for the nurse and speak to the nurse. There's a social work issue, and then you call in and ask for the social worker. This basically, you're not only advocating for your loved one, you're also letting the facility know that you are you care and you wanna make sure your loved one is uh, being taken care of. And um, it basically lets everybody know that you might not want to neglect this person because I'm checking in to make sure that my loved one is being taken care of. Now we're in COVID-19 and there's a limitation in time. Uh, there's even greater limitation within resources available to patients. What would you say are some practical steps in which patients can take to ensure that when they are having those encounters, that they're getting the best care that they possibly can? It's a very good question. Um, what I'm advising my clients is to basically create our emergency packet. In that packet, you're going to have all your diagnosis, all your medication list, any allergies you have, any uh, certain food restraints you have, um, and basically take that with you when you go to the hospital. And this, and also you're in that packet, you want to make sure all your emergency contacts, like your loved ones, informations are there, all your providers. And when you have that information with you and you go into the setting, you know, it, it makes it a lot easier for the healthcare providers to give you help because you already have all the information at hand. What are some advice that you may have for people who are chronically ill, who are taking the preventative measures to protect themselves? Are there blind spots that are not being spoken of? And what are some tools that you can provide to patients? I know everybody's talking about washing your hands. Definitely wash your hands but also don't forget to moisturize. If your hands are dry and they're cracked, you're actually gonna have some little skin tears in your hand and you're gonna increase your risk of having um, an infection. So you wanna avoid that and make sure you're uh, moisturizing your hands after you wash your hands. The other thing that I'm advising my clients is to basically stop wearing their contacts. You know, When you're touching your eye to put a contact in, you're bringing your hand into your face and you're increasing the risk of you know, just bringing some type of infection in towards your face, especially like when you're looking at the context of when we're discussing COVID. So I'm encouraging them to wear their glasses. It protects your eye, plus it also decreases the risk of you bringing any type of infection towards your face. Um, or if you don't have glasses, um, wear sunglasses when you're going outside. Again, it's protecting your eyes. From a public health standpoint and a patient advocacy standpoint, can you talk about ways in which we can use policy to help protect patients or to advocate for patients? I'm a strong uh, advocate of creating a office of patient advocacy in, within the Department of Health. And um, basically the department would be created for individuals who are having issues with their providers or facilities or insurance companies that they can go to and they can find an advocate there that can step in, independent of those uh, individuals or facilities and advocate for them. For people who may have financial barrier to access and help, what are some practical things that you can say to them right now to help them um, as they're facing those financial barriers and challenges? When it comes to medication, what I've discovered is like a lot of the manufacturers have discounts that they can provide you. So that's something to explore. Um, the other thing is call the billing department up and say, hey, this is my income. It's going to make it very difficult for me to pay rent, pay my utilities, and pay this bill. Is there something that we can work out that I can help me? Uh, is there any other resources that you know of that I can utilize um, to help me pay this bill? And you'll be surprised. There's quite a few uh, things out there that can help pay, uh, you know, basically either alleviate some of the bill or to help pay for the bill. For patients with bill collectors that are calling them and saying, we need our money, we need our money now, what can you say to those patients to help them navigate those conversations so that that is at least one less stressor on, on, on their life? If it comes to the point where they're harassing you, um, I would reach out to some government organizations and say, hey, 
you know, I'm basically not able to afford this, but I'm being constantly harassed. This is causing me a lot of stress. And sometimes when you bring um, that, those organizations involved, they tend to back off too, especially when it comes to like hospitals and things like that. Um, when they are constantly harassing you and whatnot, and you're saying, well, you know, this is kind of harassment. I'm going to go to the Department of Health or the Department of Finance and tell them that I can't afford this, but you constantly, you know, no, no organization wants to be looked at as a, as a aggressor towards a, an individual who, who truly can't pay for their bills. There might be folks who are listening and they're saying, hey, we want to get back to um, healthcare settings. We want to get back to healthcare communities. What are some things that they can do to help healthcare workers, to help healthcare facilities um, as we're navigating um, COVID-19? Donating N95 masks, which are, there's a great shortage for. Um, some facilities are taking food for their employees, you know, that you can donate and and you know, basically remind them that you're thinking about them. Some of the uh, residents, there's organized, like I would reach out to the recreational department. They're having people write letters to them to say, hey, we're thinking about you, especially for these individuals that don't have anybody in the community right now that's reaching out for them, checking on them, that you can write a letter and say, you know, I'm reaching out to you to basically let you know that I care about you, even though I don't know you. So there's a lot of things that we can do right now. Any final thoughts? It seems overwhelming right now, but we all just need to take a step back and relax and we can handle this. We, 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 we're all patient advocates and we, we can go out and advocate for not only, not only for us, but also the people that, you know, that are the most marginalized and bring them into the fold and help them. I appreciate the tools and tips that you provided to patients and caregivers and even healthcare workers. I've learned so much and I am just so very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you.